Brought to you by FlowSpark Media. Whether it's an iPhone or whatever kind of smartphone, it conveys this idea of purity, of aesthetic perfection. How do you want to believe a single second that what is clean, what is beautiful, at least in your hand, what is beautiful, can be dirty at the same time? Welcome to another episode of the Synapse series on Science Centric. This series is where we have thought-provoking conversations about science, society, and the natural world. And who am I? I am your host, Eric Olson, filmmaker, journalist, and all-around curious creative with a passion for science and nature. But before we jump into this episode, just a quick reminder to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell for notifications when new content goes live. Thanks for helping this channel to grow and for making the world a little more science-centric. Now, the Western world has just finished its Christmas celebrations, and as we're heading into the new year, people are naturally reflecting on the previous year and how they might do better in the next one. So I thought it would be a good time to talk to journalist Guillaume Patron about his new book, The Dark Cloud. It's all about the environmental and social costs of the technology we carry around in our pockets every day and the massive infrastructure that supports it. The goal of this episode isn't to shame people into not using digital technology. That would be a little hypocritical considering all of the technology used to create and distribute the very episode you're listening to right now. The goal is to encourage people to be a little more mindful about how they use technology. Despite feeling like the cloud exists everywhere and nowhere all at once, it does exist somewhere and it has real world impacts. So without further ado, here's Guillaume. Your new book is entitled The Dark Cloud. What is the dark cloud? I know that's a broad topic and what makes it dark? Well, what's the cloud first? Between you and I, there is a cloud. Whatever I'm saying right now as I speak to you is being stored in a cloud, which means in a server. And my voice then is taking the direction of your computer. And each and every day, I will use 100 clouds. And you will use 100 clouds on average. Because whenever I send an email or whenever I swipe on a dating website, whenever I send a like or order a pizza on a website, my information, my data is being stored into a server. And then the other person or the company wanting to get my information will connect on the same server. And this server is in a cloud, which means that this is a data which is outsourced from my computer. And wherever I am in the world, basically, uh, I will find this data back, my email, for example, because it's in the cloud. And the cloud is dark uh, because actually um, it depends on the kind of electricity that makes the cloud uh, run. The cloud needs to work 24-7, 365 days a year. There cannot be any interruption of the cloud. Because if there is an interruption, that means that you can't surf on the internet, you can't go on the internet, you can't go on your email. And you don't imagine that you would like to go on your Gmail account and having the web page of Gmail saying, oh, sorry, we're down, come back tomorrow. It's just impossible. So because you want to be able to access your email, access Facebook, access WhatsApp, uh, access ChatGPT, or whatever kind of web services, at any time of the day or the year, um, you need to make sure the, 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 the companies of the cloud operating the cloud need to make sure that actually it's uh, running all the time. And uh, that means that you will uh, actually replicate the cloud several times. So if there's one uh, cloud running down out of power, like one warehouse with a server inside, then you have replicated the same data in another uh, server that will just run immediately instead of the first one and make sure that actually there is no interruption of service. And uh, all this is very, very much electricity consuming. And um, depending on the kind of electricity that is being used for running the cloud, the cloud may be dark. If the cloud is running out of uh, power produced by green electricity, by like a wind farm or a solar farm, it may be a green cloud. <laughs> and when the cloud is running thanks to um, coal-made electricity, oil-made electricity, gas-made electricity, which is uh, basically the first 
source of production of electricity today in the world where the cloud emits CO2, it is responsible for climate change, and it is a, it's, it's a dark cloud. So the book is entitled The Dark Cloud because it's an investigation on the cloud. So you're, you're calling it the dark cloud because you're saying that it primarily runs on coal. Is that correct? Well, basically, I would answer a bit differently. Uh-huh. I would say the first source of electricity in the world today is fossil fuels. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first way to produce electricity is, um, is coal, uh, but it's also gas and it's also oil. So when you make an addition of all these sources of electricity, when you want to heat yourself or when you want to, when you want to run an electric car or when you want to use, globally speaking, um, internet, you will uh, use electricity which is produced out of these uh, sources of electricity which are not clean, right. uh, which are emitting CO2 and which are responsible for climate change. And the thing is, the cloud, at least the American cloud, and I'm thinking about Microsoft Azure, for example, or Amazon Web Service, or maybe uh, Google. Uh, well, Google, maybe, well, there is a cloud with Google, obviously. And uh, these companies are very much aware of uh, you know this situation, and have been much more and more aware for the last years uh, about this, thanks to Greenpeace America, by the way, because mm-hmm. Greenpeace America for the last ten years have been uh, very much working on this and very much uh, claiming in the public space that there is a link between the cloud and global warming. And these companies, which are in the United States running the cloud, have done lots of efforts in order to actually uh, uh, change their electricity. Uh, and, and produce uh, and, and run their cloud of electricity, which is coming from solar panels, wind farms. So I don't have a specific figures that I'm speaking to you now, mm-hmm. but there is a good chance that actually the cloud of the United States, at least of these three companies, which are very important, as you as you as you guess, in in, in the in the cloud service industry, are running their electricity out of uh, other sources of electricity. But globally speaking. Once again, internet, which runs everywhere from North Korea to the United States, from Chile to South Korea and, and Japan and China, and from Johannesburg to Paris. Globally speaking, the electricity, first and foremost, comes from dirty sources of electricity. So it's, it's, it's fair to call the cloud, globally speaking, the dark cloud. Dark cloud. And do we have any sense of how much of the internet is running on clean fuel versus dirty fuel or, or fossil fuels? It's- it's very hard to tell, Eric. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah. No. Well, first, uh, figures are not being updated every day, and figures change very quickly because the industry is changing very quickly. The, the industry has understood uh, this link, uh, as I mentioned, between the cloud, which seems like something invisible and touchable, actually, which is made of very tangible assets, very tangible infrastructures. And it's links to uh, climate change. So it's changing very fast. Uh, figures which used to be produced by uh, Greenpeace on a yearly basis, on a, uh, they're not produced by Greenpeace on such an annual basis anymore. Mm. So it's very hard to give you a, a large figure. What I can tell you is that internet, but more generally the digital world, mm-hmm. uh, which goes from the mining, because you need resources coming from the ground, you need to unearth them in order to you know, manufacture phones and servers and cables, but also the electricity for the cloud, um, electricity for running the cables, submarine cables, which is the only way to transmit 99% of the data between uh, continents yeah. going through the seas. Yeah. This electricity being needed for this ecosystem that we call the digital ecosystem uh it it, it requires 10 uh, percent of the world production of electricity 10 percent 10 percent if we turn this figure into co2 emissions into co2 emissions and we've done that uh this figure has been produced and there is a quite a consensus among researchers it represents four percent of world co2 emissions okay to give you a comparison all the planes flying on the tops of our heads I'm, I'm talking about the commercial planes, civil planes. It uh, amounts for 2.4% of world CO2 emissions. And uh, internet and the digital world in general 
accounts for 4%. And given the fact that we spend more and more time on the web, uh, given the fact that uh, whenever I want to do on research on Google, I may turn to uh, ChatGPT uh, rather than Google, given the fact that there is every day a new way of using the internet yeah. for people, for companies, for states, this uh, 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 impact of the digital world on the planet is gaining higher and higher and higher. And some studies actually suggest, and we might believe them, that the digital world uh, has actually the fastest growing ecological impact over the planet than any other industry around the world. And that 4% figure may become worldwide in terms of CO2 emission, may become 8% within 15 years, 20 years, yeah. nobody knows precisely. But I mean, that's getting serious. And it's time that we understand that there is nothing virtual, that there is nothing in material, non-material, yeah. that uh, the cloud is real. And if we don't understand that, we're getting, enough, we're getting ahead of problems. And that's why I wanted to make this investigation on the cloud. Hey there, if you made it this far through the episode, you're probably enjoying this conversation and learning a few new things along the way. If so, I'd really appreciate your support so that we can bring you even more quality science and nature content to YouTube. Head on over to our Patreon page to find out how you can support us directly. We have three tiers you can join and they start at only a dollar a month. The link's in the description below. And thank you to our existing patrons for their support. Now on with the show. So I'm in New York City and I was just down at the Google uh, store in Manhattan. And you go, I was just thinking about this as I was reading your book and you go in and it's very clean and everything's very white and there's no cables anywhere. And, you know, they have these lovely devices that are very sleek looking, but there's all this, you know, your book is about all this stuff going on behind the scenes of that. And a lot of it's very dirty, you know, in terms of, of, of mining and stuff. Could you just, um, for, for listeners, could you just take us through, let's say you're on Facebook and your, your friend posts a photo, uh, or your family member posts a photo and you hit like what happens, you know, it just seems magical almost. It seems just in this ether. But what is what what happens when you click like on that on that photo? Well, uh, first, I, I, I'm, I, I was interested in what you said. Walking in New York and passing by an Apple shop, everything is is clean, and the, this marketing uh, makes you believe that when when it's about the digital world, everything is clean, everything is virgin. Uh, and this is very ID, I think. When you have a phone within your hand, that's such a beautiful object. That's a piece of art. Uh, it's so it's so pure. It it conveys an idea of purity. Right. Exactly. Uh, there's no button, and, and it was meant to be that way. When when Steve Jobs, when he was producing with his engineers and his designers, the first iPhone, said to his designers, "I want a phone, an iPhone." to look as pure as possible, to convey this idea of purity, like a Zen Buddhist temple. He used to say so. He wasn't Buddhist himself, but he used to say that the aesthetics of Zen Buddhist temple in Japan was a form of, of perfection in terms of aesthetics. And so what you hold with your hands, whether it's an iPhone or whatever kind of smartphone, it conveys this idea of purity, of aesthetic perfection. How do you want to believe a single second that what is clean, what is beautiful, at least in your hand, what is beautiful, can be dirty at the same time? So there is like, a, it's counterintuitive because your senses, when I talk about your view, your eyes, you know, watch every day a beautiful object which doesn't convey at any moment this idea that behind the phone, there is something complex. And it's complex. It's complex because you need metals and minerals for making the phone, and I'll come to the Facebook question in a minute. Yeah. But because if you want to make a phone happen, you need to extract a dozens, several dozens of minerals from the ground and to future them into a phone to make everything work. And behind every you know metal of your phone, whether it's lithium, gallium, germanium, rare earths, lithium, graphite, indium, 
All these metals, whose name you might not be aware of, by the way, uh, require uh, mining operations. And that is not clean at all. And that is complex to extract them and to refine them and to process them and to transport them at the other end of the world. All this complexity is not seen and it's just not even understandable because what you have within your hands is simple, simple to use. And then I get back to your point. If I send a like on Facebook, well, that would be hard precisely to tell you about Facebook because it depends where you are in the world. If you're in the United States, if you're in Europe, you don't rely on the same infrastructures from Facebook. Mm. But if you're in the United States, I think probably the like first will, well, it's a signal. They will go from the from your phone to a 4G antenna on the top of a New York building or Houston building or wherever you are. And this signal will be, will be transformed into positions of light and the information goes into positions of light into fiber optics from the 4G antenna down the, the, the building and it goes down the sidewalk of New York City. And that position of light, your like, is actually being transported, transmitted into a fiber optic cable down the sidewalk, one meter down, and it goes into data centers. And it may go to uh, Oregon, western coast of the United States, Prineville, where Facebook has one of its most important uh, data center operations. That's one of the data centers. There are many others in the United States. And it will be stored there, and it will be replicated, as I explained before, because if this data center is running out of power, to, you need to have a replication of the same data center in order to run operations 24-7. Uh, but it will be scattered on the American territory. It may be scattered outside of the United States. This I, I'm not really sure about. When you are European consumer of internet, of Facebook services, I mean, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, uh, your like is being stored in uh, the northern parts of Europe, close to the Arctic Circle in Sweden, in Lapland. This is where <laughs> this center is. And I might explain you why it's precisely over there. But anyway, it will go into the data center and then the person who's receiving your like will connect to the same data center and get the like on, on her or his phone. And this person actually, Eric, may be sitting two meters away from you. <laughs> and maybe actually your, your, your neighbor of your office is two meters away and you like his profile and you just say to him, oh, I've just liked your profile, check it out. What you don't know is that the real distance between you and this person is not the physical distance. It's not these two meters. It's actually thousands of kilometers, which is the travel of that data. That may be a, an email. That may be a picture. That may be a video. Mm -hmm. That may be a, a Google search, a chat GPT search. All this goes all this uh, through this spider that we call the web which is made of concrete, of glass, of resources, which need electricity. And so I said to my editor, but hey, what if we do an investigation on that? What if we investigate on the contradictions of the so-called dematerialized world? Because there is no such thing as dematerialized technology, because we're talking about all this network of, of cables, fiber optics, yeah. in order to, to, to transport transport this data and what if we follow the trail of like as a journalist I, I love to follow the trail of resources i've been doing this for 15 years yeah following the trail of tomatoes you know <laughs> arabic oil coal trail of, of migrants across africa i've done this I, i've been following the trail of atoms what if i follow the trail of a bite and actually i realized that i could follow the trail of a bite and for two years i traveled all around the world including the united states following the trail of my life yeah and so when we're talking about bites we're talking about energy right we're talking about light and we're talking about you know passing information but then you're we're, you're also talking about this material uh you know atoms essentially that that comprise the infrastructure and one of the things that you brought up in the book, which I thought was really interesting, which I hadn't heard of before, was this idea, this MIPS or MIPS rating, um, and that it tells you the starting natural resources it takes to create something. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and 
I, I don't know what parts of the infrastructure are most relevant there, but I think probably for people listening, it's their phone in their pocket. So like, you know, how many material resources, natural resources, right? Does that take to say, make just your phone, just that end point of this? this massive in infrastructure that you're talking about? Well, what we need to understand is that the first ecological impact of the digital world uh, is actually uh, the phones and the tablets and the screens. 34 billion electronic devices being used uh, on Earth, as I speak to you now. And uh, all these uh, wonderful objects are very complex objects. They have gained in complexity over the last years because what you do with a phone today has nothing to do with what you used to do with a phone 10 years, 20 years before. Right now with a phone, you do much more many things than just calling someone. You meet uh, the woman of the man of your life on a phone. You order a pizza, you order a taxi, you geolocalize yourself. You make videos and you make pictures, you make films. So basically you need to concentrate objects, which maybe used to be a dozen, into a single device. Which needs, to, which needs to be very, very powerful. The power of the microprocessor within your phone right now, the processing power is the same as the processing power which used to be actually used by the NASA during uh, the 70s in order to send men on Earth. And each and every one of us, Eric, has the processing power which used to be used by the NASA as a whole 50 years ago, and each and every one of us has his power within our pockets. So the phone to be, to be manufactured is made of many metals with chemical and physical properties which are exceptional. And to extract and process these resources, you need to get them in a very diluted uh, um, state from the Earth. Mm -hmm. And the, the MIPS, M-I-P-S, Material Input Per Service Unit, is basically the ratio between the final weight of your product, this phone, mm -hmm. which is about 150 grams, and all the resources that have been moved during all the life cycle process of the phone in order to make that phone happen. So you need to move much more rocks and from the ground than the final little gram of rare earth that you're gonna get from this rock and which you're gonna to feature into your phone. And then you need to you know, uh, you know, keep in mind also and calculate the amount of water which has been necessary, for example, for processing the rock and to turn this rock into the metals. But you need also to count uh, the oil, the kerosene that has been used in order to um, uh, uh, bring together all the components of the phone from different parts of the world to uh, the manufactory where they have been assembled symbols in order to make a phone happen. So you calculate all these resources that directly and indirectly are being used to make your phone happen. And what we discover is that uh, the amount of resources necessary for, make, for making your phone, phone come to an existence is 182 times more than the final weight of the product. So, uh, no, it's, sorry, it's 1,200 times more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which means that your 150 gram four phone is actually 182 kilograms phone. Wow. That's what I meant. Wow. You need 182 kilograms of resources in order to pr produce a phone which is very light. And that's uh, in pounds. What is that? It's about 3.3 pounds per kilogram or something like that. So that'd be like 400, um, 500 pounds of raw material to into into your I, little phone i would let you calculate because i'm not sure about that i think that but i think maybe, yeah something yeah, like that ahead. something like that i think it's well yeah i'm speaking with my own metrics as a <laughs> <friend>. <laughs> I, I didn't prepare that before I was speaking with you, so. <laughs> that's okay that's okay we don't we don't have to get into that which which system's better but um <laughs> but keep in mind that objects around us are yeah. far bigger than what we think yeah. That's just an idea. Yeah. My phone is the tip of the iceberg. And as you know, what's under the sea, the part of the iceberg, which is under the sea, is far greater than just the tip of the iceberg. iceberg. So look at your phone in this way. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And you don't see what's beneath. You don't see what's behind. You don't see this ratio behind. Because basically, the mind is not in your country. 
It's somewhere in Asia, usually in poor places where nobody wants to go. And this is what we need to take into consideration. The impact on the Earth of your virtual world is far greater than what you may imagine when you hold your phones with your, within your hands. And that tells you to what extent there is no such thing as a dematerialized world. Once again, the world virtualization, putting your paycheck in the cloud, all these words which conveys an idea of non-existence right. in a physical way is very dangerous. It keeps you away from all the pollutions associated with, with, uh, with the resources needed for, for having enjoying your life on Facebook. And 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 do you think that the these big tech companies, which you called Fang, I think it's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, okay. Google, yeah, yeah Apple. Um, I mean, do they? Is that something that they're trying to obscure intentionally? Do they want to, you know, obscure from the end user that all this stuff is happening? Is it in their interest to do that? In, in a way, yes. And, and that's what I, I, I realized and I discovered while, while writing this book. Uh, because I was in Sweden, in Lapland, as I mentioned before, where Facebook has built a data center for European, African, and Middle East consumers. Like 800, peop 800 million people are stored within uh, today four data centers in the city of Luleå, just down the Arctic Circle in northern uh, Sweden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the data center, I've seen it. I've not been into it. I couldn't get into it, but I could just you know, walk around it. And this data center is terribly boring. And whenever you want to talk about this data center in Lapland, in Luleå, in this city of Lapland, everyone's bored about it. And I realized that actually Facebook was making everything possible to be very discreet to make itself quite invisibilized. Like, you know, no one would really care talking about them. They've just come to being boring. And I realized that there were other companies. Actually, Facebook in Sweden is being legally branded as Pinnacle Sweden. The legal name for Facebook in Sweden, or these infrastructures of Facebook, of Meta, is Pinnacle Sweden. Huh. It's not Facebook itself. And I realized also that uh, Amazon Industries does the same, Amazon Web Services does the same with some of its data centers on the eastern coast of the United States. Yeah. The data centers are being uh, uh, you know, legally registered by the name um, Vandalay Industries. Yes. We also realized that, and it's a very interesting stuff, that uh, there was a data center being built by Apple. I think that was in Texas. Uh, you may check it out, but that was in southern part of the United States. That was a couple of years ago. And the data center would not appear when it was under construction on Google Maps. Mm -hmm. And it would only appear on Google Map whenever the building was finished and whenever the data center was ready for operations, which would you know, completely you know, invisibilize the real impacts, physically speaking, of this infrastructure. So there is a paradox here, Eric, because we see Facebook logo everywhere on the screens. But we don't see Facebook anywhere in the physical world. Right. And that has been uh, studied by a researcher, by a Swedish researcher, studying the uh, Luleo Facebook case, very well explaining the strategy of becoming invisibilized. Because if we don't see you in the physical world, how do you want to be criticized? If you're untouchable in the real sense of the world, if we cannot touch Facebook in the real world because we can see the infra, how do you want to make Facebook criticizable in the real world? If you're untouchable in the virtual world, you're untouchable in the debate. Mm -hmm. That's a way to keep away any debate regarding, for example, the impact of Facebook on the environment. Right. So this was a very interesting analysis and also investigation by a researcher who I quote in the dark cloud, explaining that their strategy in a way, I wouldn't globalize that understand the analysis, but I would give, just give specific examples of ways to make yourself so discreet in the physical world that actually you can't be criticized anymore. Mm. I see. Okay. Well, one thought is that someone at Amazon has a sense of humor because Vandalay, do you know where that reference comes from, Vandalay Industries? I know, but please tell us. <laughs> this, was, this was a made up, 
<laughs> company that jo the character George on the show Seinfeld uh, was pretending to work for. So that is really funny that that has that they're actually using that and uh, and, and that tells about their intent. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. This is not supposed to be a real company. This is this is a front for for Amazon. Do you enjoy books about science and nature as much as I do? They bring a lot of information together and help you learn about science and the natural world on a much deeper level than you just get from consuming news. Well, we've curated a great list of books over at our website on a page we call The Reading Room. It also features the books of all the authors that we've had on this podcast. Any purchases made through The Reading Room help support our channel with no added cost to you. Check it out at sciencecentric.com or look for a link in the description below. I guess it does seem a little bit, uh, the word would be, I would use is nefarious because those companies control a lot of online information, a lot of online debate. And if there's no physical location, then how do you, not like you can go pick it in front of, I mean, I guess you can go to Amazon headquarters, but we don't even, I mean, we don't even know where these data centers are. We don't know much about how the company actually functions or, yeah, it's interesting. How do you want to go on strike in a warehouse which doesn't exist? Right. I mean, the, the apparition centuries ago of this, of, 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 um, of, um, um, how do you say, um, uh, labor unions has been made possible because there were a place where to gather and to go on strike. You would be able to prevent the access of the working force to the warehouse to stop the workforce from working that day. Uh, but because there was a physical locations on which you could operate by being on strike. But if there is no physical locations anymore in the virtual world, how, how do you want to, how do you want to access that? How do you want to have an impact? physically speaking on them by having any action. I don't say violent actions, but right, just action. Right. Yeah. And this is a point. And I've also studied that and I've discovered that this, you know, this, this has been solved by US uh, uh, thinkers, US university researchers, saying that because you can't go on strike in the virtual world, or you can't complain about something in the physical world, I mean, then it means that the, the struggle has to move from the physical world to the virtual world and how do you struggle in the virtual world where you for example you you become um, um, a hesical hacker uh, you become someone trying to block the access to a website and that's a way actually to express your complaints mm. acting on on a company but acting in the acting in the virtual world and, and not in phys, in the physical world again so in a way that disappearance at least this lack of visibility of the infra means that if you want to criticize it, if you want to complain about it, if you want to struggle against any kind of physical impact, environmental impact they have, this has to be rethought. So working on a book, writing a book is a way to do it. Yeah. But acting in the virtual world, playing the same roles as this company play, is also another way to do it. Because otherwise, if you want to complain about... Uh, about the cloud, well, you, you need to go to Lapland or you need to go to the desert of Utah, <laughs> where many companies have put their, their data centers, but it, it's hard to do. Yeah. So what Greenpeace has been doing, uh, it was about 10 years ago, is that they flew some huge balloons uh, over the headquarters of Facebook uh. among companies. And uh, it was like huge, huge like um, 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 balloons. And on, on this uh, balloon, it, it was written, how clean is your cloud? And there would be many pictures and videos. It was uh, being taken out of these uh, uh, actions by Greenpeace. And that was a way to actually complain and act uh, on, on, on this specific topic. Uh, but not everyone has uh, you know, the, 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 the capacity of action of such an NGO like, like Greenpeace. Yeah. Yeah, they circumvented the, uh, the system there. So, I mean... Certainly the, the internet and, you know, all the technology supporting it. I mean, it's this huge, it's this amazing tool that we have to reach people uh, all over the globe. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of staggering. 
And I think you, at least in a couple of um, points in the book, you referred to us as being gods because we sort of almost have this godlike power now to like reach out and, you know, communicate with anyone ac across the, the globe. But when we're talking about like the environmental impact that these technologies have, there's this like paradox that if you're trying to say something about it and you're trying to critique it, let's say, you're also using that technology <laughs> to spread your message. <laughs> and this comes up a lot when you're, you know, you'll, people will, with environmental activ activists and other types of activists and they show up at the, you know, protest or rally and they've all got iPhones, you know, like, so you wrote something um, that I thought was really just nailed it. You said, you wrote, you don't realize that by making digital the instrument of your emancipation, you are running you're rushing into the arms of your new master. So how do you resolve this paradox, I guess, that, that we have these amazing tools of communication, but by using them, we're also kind of playing into that game? Um, when I wrote that, I was specifically targeting the Greta generation, the, the youth. Greta Thunberg, and the, the climate activist. Yeah, Greta Thunberg. Uh, I, I like Greta Thunberg, by the way, but I just wanted to raise a contradiction here. Uh, this new generation, very much aware of plastic pollution, that eating too much meat is bad for the climate, aware that taking planes is bad for the climate, but at the same time, spearheading the new ways of using these technologies to such an extent where it may become just incompatible with the fight against climate change. And I, I've been making a, making a parallel between the 1968 generation, our parents going into the streets with the socialist uh, dreams, but who ended up working in oil companies at a very, at a very high level. So the, the discrepancy between the dreams of your youth and what you've made of these dreams whenever you became older. And I'm asking the same question to the Greta Thunberg generation. Uh, you're, you're spearheading climate movements, and that's wonderful. But you're also opening a new chapter of human impacts on the Earth, and you're spearheading it. And if you are going too much into that direction, uh, you put actually, actually exactly your struggle at your party. Now, what I'm saying, and I want to be very precise, Eric, I'm living with my time. I need internet to speak with you. Yeah. I need internet to criticize internet. <laughs> Such a paradox. I have this very well understanding that if I had to speak with you by coming to the United States and taking a plane, rather than speaking online, my CO2 impact would be much worse. And in that way, internet is a good thing for the environment. I mean, it 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 may, uh, you know, prevent actions in the real world to take to to happen, and it might be good for 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 mitigating my CO2 impact. I also understand that we need internet for making good actions and, and going on strike on a Friday when you are of the generation of Greta Thunberg uh, for protesting against um, inactions, uh, political inactions against climate change is a good thing. So it brings a question which is, how do you use internet? And this question is not being asked. You know, no, we have the next iPhone coming and no, we have ChatGPT coming and we have just new technologies. And we are so fascinated by these technologies. And the question is just, oh, what new technology will I use? What new software? Which new hardware? But the question is, for what freaking purpose? And this question is not being asked. And the question is a cost, should be a cost-benefit analysis between what it costs, including for the environment, but also for your mental health, or for democracy in the United States to use too much social media, yeah. And what, what benefit you get out of it. But this question isn't being asked, Eric, because what people in the industry want me to be is a consumer. Right. He's not a citizen. And as long as I remain a consumer with the devices, I will just look for my immediate benefit. If I'm being asked to act as a, as a citizen, I will make the question more complicated. I will bring in the debate more angles, and we think of internet in a social way, in a political way, in an economic way, in a mental health way. But once again, we need to act as citizens, and we're not doing this. We're not doing this cost-benefit analysis. 
And in my view, there are two reasons for this. First, because we believe internet has no impact on the planet, zero impact. So why should I prevent myself from watching the next videos of cats as it has no impact? Mm -hmm. It has an impact, mm -hmm. but because I have this belief that it doesn't, why should I you know, prevent myself? And the second thing is we believe it's free, free for, for, for literally free. Like, I don't have to pay anything for that. And this is false. Yeah. And someone has yeah. said, as you know, if it's free, it's because you're the product. <laughs> it's not free. That's right. It's free because you are giving your data. You're giving, you're giving, you're giving pieces of yourself, piece of you, who you are, in exchange for a, a, a service on the web, which is given, given for free in exchange for the data. And actually, they're making money out of the data. Yeah. And because you believe that it's not impactful at all and because it's free because it is a business model of, of, of google today and of facebook to just name a few well basically we just keep using more and more and more like in an open bar you pay for entering and then you can do whatever you want for the rest of the night believe me you will end up just giving completely drunk <laughs> and this is exactly the same we're drunk of the services because we don't understand that it's not free and it's not uh impact free on the planet too yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think um, if you are using something like that, where it's a free service, and you can't figure out how are they making money off of this? It's because they're making money off of you, you are, like you said, you're the product. That's how they're making money. They're not making money out because you're not paying for it. Somebody's paying for it. Somebody's got to pay those engineers salaries to create this, whatever yeah. that thing is. Yeah. Um, but I think Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think what, but I think a lot of people are aware of that now, you know, our people of a certain, you know, age, we've sort of been the guinea pigs for the last 10 or 15 years of this, especially of social media, you know, on, and, and I think people, I think people younger too are becoming more aware of this as, you know, as they come into it, um, that, that they're, nothing's private, that they don't have their privacy. But I think what your book does so well is it just, it elucidates all the other material costs of, of using those technologies that I don't think people are aware of. Um, and as I, I was, sorry, just let me, I was just going to add one more thing. It's just as I was preparing to talk to you, because um, if you looked around me, you'd see I was surrounded by technology right now. Um, you know, lights, cameras, you know, computers, but I just was aware of it. I became more aware of it. And I was thinking about all the ways that I was connecting with the cloud, you know, all the Google, I love Google. I love, I mean, that's, I run so much of my life with Google and I was like, wow, I, I'm thinking now about where this information is going, how it's being stored. So I think this, I think your book's fantastic in that regard. Thank uh, you very much. Yeah. I do appreciate it. That's, a, that's an angle that we haven't thought about until now. That's kind of a new angle. Yeah. And that's why I was so fascinated by this story, by this investigation, because it took me all around the world to talk about something which I wasn't aware myself of, and I knew no one would be aware of. And I think what we can bring with a book is something new to the public, something which was unsaid. Maybe a place to wrap up our conversation is in. 2023 going into 2024 as a as a human on planet earth as a citizen like what can we do individually um to minimize our digital impact and and extend that to companies as well because i think there are a lot of people in companies that are well-meaning that see uh, see these new technologies and go oh wow this is fantastic and they don't even think about these these environmental or material costs, social costs of using these technologies? Like what, what can they do? Like that actually makes a difference that's not greenwashing. So the, the good news, Eric, is that there are many things we can do individually, as you said, and that companies can do. Uh, the first thing you need to do individually and the first thing companies need to do is to make people and to make yourself keep phones and tablets and computers longer. Usually, on average, we keep our phone for like two years and then we change. Well, we should keep it for four years, five years, six years, and companies should push their uh, employees to do the same. And if they don't want their employees to keep their phones for two years for cybersecurity issues, for example, at least make sure that the phone, uh, we 
which is still a workable phone, it can be resold to a second-hand platform company or given to an NGO, which will give it to people who are needing it. But there will be a second life to all your electronic devices leaving your company. Uh, my phone is an iPhone uh, 7. I bought it uh, three years ago. It was already second-hand. I repaired it 10 times. Wow. Screen, battery, button. It's still working. And maybe I can keep it for two more years. So doing this helps mitigating the cost of the internet of the digital world environment in an incredible way. Uh, so that the first thing to do. Uh, I think also what you can do, individually speaking, is uh, that may be strange just to say so, but whatever you can use a Wi-Fi, rather than 4G or 5G, mm. use Wi-Fi. Uh, when you watch a video on Wi-Fi, the electricity that you will consume will be much less, maybe 10 times less. Uh. Figures depend than if you use a 4G device. Uh, this is the difference between Wi-Fi and 4G. Uh, it's huge, so whatever your home, just set your standard mode on Wi-Fi. That makes a difference. If you can, don't watch a video on your phone with a high definition. Because with a low definition or high definition on a small phone, that doesn't change anything. But still, I mean, for, you, for your eyes, that doesn't change anything. But in terms of electricity consumption for a high definition picture, it's much more than for a low definition picture. So if you can put your phone, the videos on YouTube, on the standard mode, which is low definition when you're on your phone, mm. Actually, that makes a world of a difference. I would say if you don't need to use ChatGPT, don't use ChatGPT. Use Google. I don't have the specific figures, but a search on Google maybe much less than you know digging all the web to find an analysis, a synthesis of an answer on ChatGPT. Um, also, for a company, and that may be my last advice, uh, you want to have your data from your company in the cloud. Every company now is moving to the cloud. It's so easy to run your data when they're in the cloud. That's much more safe. Now the question is, where is the cloud? Literally speaking, is it close to your offices? Is it far? Because the data will have to travel more. And that will come at a cost for the environment because there is an energetic cost of transporting the data from your office to the other end of the world if the cloud is very far. Depending also on where the country is, your cloud will run on coal, oil, or nuclear, or wind farms. So that is worth asking, if you can, uh, to the cloud provider, what is its electricity mix and where, physically speaking, the cloud is. Because actually, if it's in China or in the United States or in Europe, the electricity mix is different. So when you're a company, you can, you, you can have an impact here by choosing the provider of a cloud whose electricity mix is as green as possible. These are a few examples of what you can do as an individual, mm -hmm. what you can do as a company to make things change, and there is no fatality. Do you work for a science or technology focused organization and would like to create video content, but don't know where to start? Well, my company, Flosberg Media, the publisher of this podcast, can help you. We are a one-stop shop that can provide content strategy, video production, and even social media management. Our previous clients include educational institutions, academic publishers, trade organizations, and aerospace companies. These are innovative, world-changing organizations who are leading humanity toward a brighter future. Learn more at flowspark.com or look for the link in the description below. One thing that, you know, these companies that are hosting these data centers, these uh, server farms or data centers, whatever you want to call them, I mean, they often say that they are trying to become more efficient. They're switching to green energy, so on and so forth. Um, one of the things, uh, this is another paradox that I've run across, and there was a great book um, I read uh, and I don't know if you've read it, but it's called Force of Nature, the unlikely story of Walmart's green revolution it was all about how Walmart, which, you know, at the was the Amazon of the early 2000s, was finding ways to reduce their ecological footprint, coming up with less packaging, this sort of stuff. But there's a big caveat there. When they switch to greener methods, greener technologies, they save money because they're using less to do more. And then when they save less 
when they save money, they, they put it back into expansion to growth. And so the net <laughs> effect is <laughs> the, the net effect is zero because they've just become more efficient essentially. So, um, I guess, I don't know what my question is there, but is there a way, I guess, to push back against that with, with companies and not just, ne not necessarily with tech companies, but, but I, I feel like other companies do that sort of thing too. Well, uh, Eric, um, you're raising a very interesting point. And this is exactly the same thing happening in the digital world. Exactly the same Walmart thing. And we call it in the dig digital world, we call it the rebound effect. And basically, companies are rushing to use more green electricity so that whatever you do, you will have a lesser impact on the environment, on, on the climate change. And they're rushing to actually uh, 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 being more efficient in their data storage processes. Uh, there are some ratios which are very well known by the industry which is uh, the PUE, the power unit efficiency. So basically, basically how much power do you use for one byte of data being stored? And the more researchers, the more uh, innovation, technological development is going on, the more uh, actually uh, the, the, the mitigation is obvious and, and the more it is efficient. The thing is, at the same time, is you, we use more and more of these devices. And, uh, you know, I just would like to compare with you. Uh, you probably my age, I'm 43. I, have, I had my, four, my first phone in the year 2000. Okay. And at the time, I had the right, paying for one, one month's uh, uh, fee, to send 40 text messages a month. <laughs> How many text messages do I send every hour today? 40. This is a rebound effect. So on one hand, you gain something, exactly like Walmart. And on the other hand, we are just, you know, spending so many text messages for saying nothing. Oh, I'm here. I'm just coming in a minute. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. On the one hand, Google is really, you know, making its operations. A search on Google is, is, is costing less to the earth. On the other end, we're all rushing to chat GPT, which is much more important impact. So what you get on one hand, you lose it on the other end. This is what we call the rebound effect. Mm -hmm. So this is a race between the power of the technology mm -hmm. to make things better and the, our capacity to use wisdom to make a better use of these technologies. This is a forward of, my, of the dark cloud by Stephen Hawking. Not the forward, just the quote by uh, Stephen Hawking, which I wanted to use. But basically, we are in a race here, and we already know who's winning, the, who's winning that race. And this is the ways, the new ways we use internet. Because in the future, we're going to produce so much data for running generative AIs, connected farms, uh, smart buildings, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, non-fungible tokens, and whatever, that it will go way beyond the capacity of the technologies to actually mitigate that impact. Yeah. At least, unless there is like a amazing technologies changing the rules of the game, like a game changer, we are on a pace that where actually the technology will not go fast enough in order to mitigate the new ways we have to use these technologies. Yeah. So this is exactly the same Walmart effect. And we can't understand yeah. the digital impact the impact of the digital world on the earth if we don't take into consideration all these new technologies which comes with new cost and once again everyone's r running after these new ways of using these services yeah. well i'm a i'm a little bit older than you i'm 47 so i i do remember when we had to pay per text message we had to you know we had to pay for you only got a certain number and then you you had to pay more so um, and that, those were like what kilobytes of data. I mean, text messages are like kilobytes or something. I mean, they're tiny. So let me let me ask you uh, one more question, which is, you know, just speculatively, like like let, let's say if nothing changes, let's say if you know you're talking about some game changing technology like quantum computing, for example, that would dramatically increase the efficiency of 
you know, computing in general. Um, and, and let's say 25 years from now, if we continue on this path, if we don't change what we're doing, what do you think the world would look like in terms of how much energy consumption is happening from our digital infrastructure? These figures are being uh, produced already today by research institutes uh, wherever around the world. Uh, so there are, uh, yeah, um, figures which are being assumed, you know, as of 2030 or 2050. Depends on many scenarios, but if we are in the business as usual scenario, uh, I mentioned a figure before, uh, which was uh, 8% uh, CO2 emission figure just for the digital world. In terms of electricity, uh, we might double that amount of electricity. Uh, it might not be 10% of the world consumption of electricity for the digital world, but 30%, uh, 20%, sorry. And that may be by 2035, 2040. Mm -hmm. It's even more in 2050. Uh, that may make the digital world just inconsistent with the fight against climate change. Yeah. Just inconsistent. Uh, and this is also what I want to, what I want to stress here. We, we need to care about that, or otherwise um, we're, we're being in, in, in big trouble. Um, and this and this impact is not only in terms of energy consumption, CO two emissions. It is a material impact of, of the virtual world. It is a mining. It is a processing. It is all the impact on the environment, such as pollution on waters, on soils, artificialization of soils, acidification of oceans, uh, biodiversity losses. Uh, planetary boundaries, uh, which are directly linked to the mining industry for making phones and tablets and computers. Yeah, uh, and this is not necessarily about CO two because we tend to think only in terms of CO two emissions. Uh, but actually, our our ecological actions may have positive impacts way beyond only CO two emissions or 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 or, 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 or mitigation of emissions. It, it's all this examples that I've given, which we also need to take into consideration. So I'm a bit worried because I don't think there is wisdom here, Eric. I think, and, and I wouldn't like to be Biden or my own president, Macron, because on the one hand, what I'm telling you is just obvious. It's, it's just figures produced by researchers from the best universities and, 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 and research bodies in the world. On the other hand, if we on if, if the United States, if France, European countries are not within that race for 5G, for deep learning, for generative AIs, what's happening is that China will lead the mm. race. Russia may lead the race. And, and in a way, still being in a race means keeping my sovereignty, my industrial sovereignty, my geopolitical sovereignty, my technological technological sovereignty, my cultural sovereignty. I don't want to be a cyber colony of China. Right. But if I don't want to be a cyber colony of China, I better have my own 5G antennas and, and my own phones and my own web services and my own chat GPT made by the Europeans. And you know you see here, and I can't reply, I, I, I can't find the you know the how to bring these contradictions together. On the one hand I need to protect the environment. I need to make the mm -hmm. internet world consistent with the fight against climate change in the Paris Agreement. On the other hand, we are moving into a much tough world with much more geopolitical tensions, where the mastering of the internet, of digital technologies, will be key for leading the 21st century. How do you bring these two objectives, these two goals together? That is a very hard question to tell, and I don't have the answer, yeah. the answer as you know. Yeah, I... I feel that way too. I feel like we're we're trying to apply old models of thinking to new problems that sort of transcend what our you know the, our ways of thinking, even in terms of politics. Because are we you know we have conservative and liberal you know in the United States? Like, does that really fit with the way the world is today and all the, the actual problems we have? And I feel like it doesn't. I feel like we have to. We have to come up with new ways of thinking about things. Um, yeah, and that's what people do. And that's why also I speak about them, uh, several parts of the book, but also in the, in the conclusion, saying, oh, we see societies 
small societies or thinkers or makers organizing into communities where they think of a different way of using internet. But that means also a different way of organizing themselves, creating new social links with each other, but also around a new way of using these technologies. But usually it's about uh, more sovereignty. And uh, mm -hmm. it's only a tiny percentage of the world population really do so. Uh, even myself, I'm not sure I would be ready to live in such a way, my, my, my relation to digital, digital technologies. Uh, so uh, I try to open the different features to show the different features which are being possible, which are being thought, which are being already put into practice by certain groups of people, whether the most techno-enthusiastic or the most uh, you know, uh, <laughs> radical community of makers, including in the United States, I don't, there is nothing judgmental here. But just to tell you that uh, all these societies do exist today and uh, the future is already being written in these societies, which I've been trying to meet uh, around my, my researchers, my investigation. Yeah, very cool. Uh, very interesting. And we could probably talk about uh, that aspect of it for couple of hours um because <laughs> it does that's i mean that's one thing i love about your work is it it touches on so many different things going on let's say and i was actually a little worried when we first started talking i was like where do i start because this is you know it touches everything uh so guillaume uh it's been a pleasure talking to you again and um you, such a fascinating read and um we didn't really touch very much on on some of the more uh, the sort of travel aspect of this and some of the crazy places that you went. So if people want to learn more and, and kind of go with you on this journey, they should definitely check out your book. Um, and speaking of which, uh, where can they find the book and what, uh, where else could they find you if they want to interact with you online Whoa. in the uh, cloud, if they want to interact with you in the cloud? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you find me in the cloud. You find me on my Hotmail account. Uh, I have a website, uh, guillaumepitron.com. My email is uh, public. Uh, you find me on social networks. Please do connect. Uh, so that's uh, via the cloud. You find the books in the cloud on Amazon.com. You find <laughs> you find the books. So you see, I, I'm I'm in a way contradictory. And physically speaking, by the way, I may be traveling to the United States end of February, beginning of March. Speaking in Miami, New York, DC, maybe San Francisco, uh, end of February, beginning of March. Promoting the, the dark cloud to the American public. Awesome. And that will be on my website. Uh, every date, every tour, every detail will be on the website. All right, cool. So if people want to reach out reach out yeah. but but do so mindfully like don't don't send don't set guillaume like a ton of messages you know think about be be mindful of your messages um well, anyway. the mindful of, of sending a message would be to invite me for a conference in the united states at these dates there you go i still have a free agenda so uh, please do let me know if you want me to be somewhere because we could discuss that that's a mindful way of sending me an email <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right thanks again thank you very much eric well, that's it for this show, and I hope you learned as much as I did. If you'd like to reduce your online footprint, you should consider joining Digital Cleanup Day coming up this March 16th. A link to the event page is in the description. Before we sign off, a quick reminder to like this episode and leave a comment on anything you found interesting. Until next time, I'm Eric Olson. Mm -hmm.